Hey, I'm Pratik Soni and I will be presenting our paper which builds time and space efficient zero knowledge arguments from groups of unknown order. This is joint work with Justin Holgrim, Ron Rothblum, Alon Rosen and Alex Block who will take over for the second part of the talk. Let's begin. Zero knowledge protocols are a cornerstone of modern cryptography and they enable a verifier to check the truth of an arbitrary mathematical statement without revealing any information. Zero knowledge enables a number of exciting applications, including delegating computations to the cloud and cryptocurrencies with interesting properties like succinctness and privacy. A bit more formally, zero knowledge argument for a language L is an interactive protocol between a prover and a verifier where the prover is given an input as input and instance from the language along with some witness and wants to convince the verifier that the instance is in the language. Our focus going forward will be on languages accepted by random access machines or RAM for short. Such arguments are required to satisfy standard properties like completeness and soundness. Additionally, we need zero knowledge which informally captures that for true statements, curious verifiers learn nothing more than the fact that the statement is true. Another important property is succinctness, which requires the proof size, which is the transcript of this interaction to be significantly smaller than the running time of the underlying RAM program. A key challenge in scaling general purpose zero knowledge is the high computational complexity of constructing such proofs or generating such proofs. And this has been the focus of recent line of research. And in terms of time complexity of the prover, we are in great shape. In theory, we now know of constructions where the prover is asymptotically almost optimal. And in some settings, one can even achieve linear time provers. The situation is surprisingly quite similar in practice and a number of systems with concretely efficient provers are being deployed. As evidenced by this graph where the y axis is the running time of the prover in deployed systems and x axis is the logarithm of the size of statements being proved. The light blue line here is the native execution which is the baseline. And quite clearly, recent deployed systems are approaching this line. So are we done? Actually, no. Although time-wise we are good, memory overheads of the prover remain a major bottleneck in current systems. In fact, SETI in his recent paper observes that the prover of the fractal system, the orange line, runs out of memory at statements of size 2 to the 18, explaining why the orange line abruptly stops midway in the graph. In fact, the state of affairs for rest of the system is not significantly better as the prover is already at the limits of memory usage for statements of size 2 to the 20 and unlikely to scale to moderate sizes of 2 to the 30 necessary to handle any interesting real-world application. Said another way, in currently implemented solutions, the prover ends up requiring space proportional to the running time of the underlying RAM program rather than its space. As a step towards addressing this key challenge, in this work, we focus on constructing zero-knowledge arguments where we want the prover running time and space to be as close to the running time and space of the underlying RAM program, where we allow polylogarithm in T overheads. I want to emphasize that time and space of the prover are both very important and would be unfair to trade one over the other. But time overheads are easier to manage. You can just let the prover run for as much time as possible. But comparatively, memory overheads are challenging. Expanding memory is non-trivial due to the hierarchical nature of modern computer systems. And often the overall running time depends on parameters like cache efficiency, which are very hard to tame. Hopefully by this point you're convinced that proof, the space of the prover is an important resource to consider. 
And with that, let's talk about prior work on getting time and space efficient provers. So there are some constructions known, but all of them have undesirable caveats. For example, Valiant and Batansky et al. give constructions from recursive composition, which requires knowledge assumptions that are poorly understood. Batansky, Chiesa and Holgrim and Rothblum give constructions with a designated verifier, which means that the verifier needs to keep some secret state. This is undesirable for applications. In a prior work with the same set of co-authors, we overcome these two limitations, but the verifier is linear, again undesirable for applications. In this work, we remove all these caveats at once. We need the hidden order assumption, which is comparatively much simpler and better studied. Our verifier is public coin and runs in sublinear time. In fact, such a result was not known even without the zero knowledge requirement. Before I can state our main result more formally, let me describe the hidden order assumption. The hidden order assumption holds in a group if it's hard to find any multiple of the order of a random group element. And classical candidate for such groups are RSA groups. Class groups of imaginary quadratic order are another candidate and in fact have received a lot of interest lately from the blockchain space. The key feature of class groups is that the description of the group, which is the discriminant delta, can be generated using public randomness. And hence, it's plausible to assume that the hidden order assumption would continue to hold even when the randomness used to sample the group is made public. In the context of applications, this provides an alternative to removing trust from the parameter generation phase, resulting in a transparent setup of parameters. On the contrary, we cannot expect something like this from RSA groups, where the description of the group is a product of two primes, and there is seemingly no obvious way to sample the product without knowing the factors. So with RSA groups, we would need trusted setup, but here the hidden order assumptions can be based on factoring. In summary, the hidden order assumption is well studied, simpler, weaker in comparison with the assumptions used in prior work that we built on. Now to state our main result, given such hidden order groups, we construct public coin zero knowledge arguments for language L accepted by time T and space S RAM mesh program, where the prover time and space and the verified time are optimal up to polylog T factors. Our protocol is interactive and has log T runs and poly log T communication. Instantiating the hidden order group with RSA group will result in an argument from factoring, but this would require trusted setup. Instantiating with hidden order class groups results in an argument with transparent setup. And finally, we can make our public coin protocol non-interactive by applying the fiat Shamir heuristic, which results in time and space efficient Zero knowledge snarks. At a very high level, our approach is to combine polynomial IOPs along with polynomial commitments. Polynomial IOPs are information theoretic proof systems where the prover sends an oracle in the first round, which embeds a polynomial and then interaction and interacts with the verifier, at the end of which the verifier asks for evaluations of this polynomial and accordingly accepts or reject this, reject this proof. Polynomial commitments, on the other hand, are cryptographic tools that allow a committer to commit to a polynomial and later reveal evaluations of this polynomial on verifier chosen points, along with a proof that it has correctly evaluated the polynomial. And we combine these two tools in the most natural way. We ask the IOP prover to send a commitment rather than the oracle highlighted in orange. And we replace the IOP verifier queries to the oracle with the evaluation protocol of the polynomial commitment scheme highlighted by blue. In fact, this approach is not new to us and is a common denominator of a number of prior schemes. 
And in fact, a time optimal prover combined with time optimal committer indeed gives a time optimal argument prover. Since we are also interested in space efficiency, it is natural to ask whether the same transformation preserves space. In fact, turns out that this question is a bit more nuanced. To get a space optimal prover for the argument, we would need a committer to run in space which is sublinear in the size of the polynomial, which is its input. This is clearly impossible for arbitrary polynomials. But in a prior work, along with the same set of co-authors, we observed that the polynomial in context has a rather space-friendly structure. Specifically, this polynomial encodes the transcript of the underlying RAM program, and hence the, its description can be generated as a stream in small space. We refer to polynomial commitments where the committer requires small space when given streaming access to this polynomial as a streamable polynomial commitment, which is what we construct in this work. More specifically, we build on a recent polynomial commitment scheme due to Bunz, Fish, and Sepinik. In fact, we find a significant bug in their scheme. The authors informed us that they also found this bug independently. Although we don't know how to fix this bug, we give a non-trivial variant of their protocol where to prove security, we leverage ideas from the theory of integer lattices. An added benefit of our protocol is that it's based on significantly weaker assumptions than the works of Bunz et al. Additionally, we also so show how to implement the committer of our scheme in small space, given streaming access to the polynomial. And finally, we develop a new proof of exponentiation protocol that is essential in getting the polylogarithmic verifier for our argument scheme. I want to emphasize that our proof of exponentiation protocol is statistically sound and works for arbitrary groups, whereas previous work only achieved computational soundness under novel cryptographic assumptions for arbitrary groups. Going back to the transformation, we take our streamable polynomial commitment combine them in a natural way with streamable polynomial IOPs from the literature and get time and space efficient public coin zero knowledge arguments. Now there are going to be there are many moving parts here and although space optimality is the killer consequence of our work and most relevant to practice, it is somehow unfortunately not the most technically interesting bit. So we won't be talking about polynomial commitments, time and space efficient implementation, and zero knowledge in the rest of the talk. Rather, we want to focus on the main ideas. And for this, Alex will discuss two sub-protocols. First is a proof of knowledge of exponent with small digits, which will highlight the bug in the Bunz et al. paper and how we fix it. And second is a proof of exponentiation protocol that leverages ideas from the proof of knowledge protocol. Alex. Over to you. Thank you very much, Pratik. Hello, everybody. I'm Alex Block, and I will begin by describing a protocol which is a succinct proof of knowledge of exponent with small digits. And as I said before, this protocol is the core of our polynomial commitment scheme. So to begin, let's fix the cyclic group G into integers B and Q. Now, our proof of knowledge of exponent with small digits, the public statement is some group element Y, and the prover is given an integer witness X. So the protocol certifies that X is a witness to Y, so that G the X equals Y, and that the base Q representation of X has small digits, bounded by B. Let's consider examples in our familiar base 10 and the bound B equal 5. So if X is 12, the verifier should accept because 1 and 2 are less than 5, or less than or equal to 5. The verifier should reject X equal 18 because 8 is bigger than 5, and the verifier should accept 252. Okay, so for the sake of this discussion, we're going to define succinctness as being requiring the proof to be of size roughly n by 2. This just means we cannot send back. So as an additional simplification, we're going to assume unit cost to send a single base q digit. And now as a warning, we're going to give a divide and conquer protocol to solve this problem. But this pro but the divide and conquer protocol is buggy and is identical to what the polynomial commitment scheme of Bones et al. do. So we're going to examine the buggy protocol first, see where the security breaks, and then describe our fix. OK, let's get to it. So like I said before, there's a very natural but buggy divide and conquer approach to obtaining n by 2 communication. Simply put, we split the statement y into two statements yl and ym, where xl and xm are the witnesses for these statements. 
We perform the split such that if x has n digits in base q, then the witnesses x on xm have n by two digits in base q. Then we somehow recombine these statements yl and ym into statement y prime, and combine x on xm into x prime. And the hope is that x prime is a witness for y prime, and that x prime has n by two digits base q that are small. If this is the case, then the prover can simply send x and we are done. So what does this protocol look like? So we're going to define xl as the encode as the base q encoding of the n by two least least significant digits of x. We're going to define xm as the encoding of the n by two most significant digits of x, and we will define yl and ym appropriately. Note that xl plus q to the n by two xm equals x, and this is the check the verifier performs under the hood as well. Now the verifier samples a random lambda bit integer. And then the proven verifier compute this random linear combination y prime as the recombination step. And similarly, the prover computes x prime equal a xl plus xn. Now the big question here is, first off, does x prime have n by two digits space q? And are these digits small? And is x prime a witness to y prime? Well, I hope you'll trust me that I, at least x prime is indeed a, a witness to y prime. But what about the other two properties? So as long as there's no overflow in the digits of a x l plus x m, we can ensure that x prime has n by two digits and that x prime has bounded digits. When can we ensure no overflow happens? As long as q is sufficiently large as shown here. So given a sufficiently large q, then x prime has n by two digits and each of them are bounded sufficiently as shown here. Okay, and at this point we're done, we just send x prime and the verifier computes its final checks and accepts or rejects. So this protocol has n by two digits plus two group elements of communication, which I will call succinct. Great. So this protocol is both succinct and complete, but what about soundness extraction? And this is where I mentioned before the bug shows up. So for extraction, we are given a cheating prover that convinces a verifier that a statement y is true with non-negative probability. And we want to extract out a small digit witness x for y from this prover. So we get, we're given an initial interaction where we send a challenge a and give are given a message x prime such that x prime has small digits and is a witness to this relation here, yl to the a times ym. So we're going to rewind the prover, send a distinct challenge a1 and receive x1 prime, and then we're going to note that x1 prime has small digits and satisfies the relation shown here. Now my claim is sufficient. Now I claim it is sufficient to extract integers xl and xm such that xl is a witness to yl and xm is a witness to ym and they have small digits base q. Why? Well, given these values, we can explicitly compute x via this li linear combination here. Okay, great. So we have a system of linear equations, which I'm gonna rewrite as this matrix vector equation. Now x prime has small digits and x one prime has small digits, as said before. Fix this matrix to be A. Let's just take the inverse, okay? Very natural approach, but very clearly there's an issue here. A inverse is rational entries. And so it's not clear if XL and XM are integers anymore. So Bunz et al. encounter the same problem, and here's how they handle it. So first off, they argue, okay, XL and XM have to be integers, otherwise the assumption, the computational assumption they assume on their group is broken. So this computational assumption is called the fractional root assumption, and it says that it's hard to compute G to the X by A for random A. Okay, this is a slightly funky assumption, but let's go with it. So we have XL and XM are integers. Now, do they have small digits? That's the big question. And the argument in Bones et al. is that, okay, x prime and x1 prime has small digits and a minus a1 is small, therefore xl and xm must be small. And this turns out to be false. So as a counterexample, we consider this implicit claim made by Bones et al. So if x has small digits base q and a is a small integer dividing x, then x divided by a has small digits base q. And small just think of as being much less than q. So there's a very easy counterexample, take an odd q, take x equal one plus q and a equal to two. Then very clearly x in base q has small digits, they're one and one, but x divided by a is equal to one plus q by two and x divided by a in base q is the same thing, which is a single large digit. Okay, so can we fix the sound as proof? Recall that we wanted x on x and to be integers with small digits base q and that we're given x prime and x one prime with small digits and this matrix a with small integer entries. And the issue was that A inverse had rational entries. So the question is, can we sample A from a distant distribution such that A inverse only has small integer entries? 
if we have this, then we are able to abstract out integers XL and XM. And furthermore, they will have small digits and we'll be done. Okay, so then we focus on answering this question. How do we do this? So our approach is a divide and conquer approach with random subset products. So the key idea is to fix a statistical security parameter lambda. So our protocol will now be a statistically secure protocol and we'll divide and conquer lambda different statements into two lambda different statements and then recombine into lambda different statements with binary challenges. What does this look like? So fix lambda statements y1 through y lambda and lambda different witnesses x1 to x lambda. Split them exactly as before in the base protocol. And now for the recombination step, we're gonna sample bits and perform a random subset product. Okay, and as I said before, these are uniformly random bits and each bit is resampled for each yi prime leading to two lambda squared bits of randomness. So at the end, the prover just sends x1 prime to x lambda prime. Okay, so let's look at the modification star protocol. First off, we have again, a statistical security parameter lambda. So our protocol is statistically secure. We have lambda different witnesses, lambda different statements, each satisfying lambda different constraints, the same constraint really. Then the prover is just gonna do exactly as we just described in the previous step. We're gonna split into two lambda different statements as shown here. And the verifier is gonna compute lambda different checks shown here. Okay, looking ahead, this check is offloaded to the prover as it is too expensive to the verifier. We offload it via our new proof of exponent protocol, which I'll talk about in a bit. So then the verifier samples lambda, uh, two lambda squared bits of randomness via this matrix A, and then recombination is done exactly as before via random subset products. And at the end, the prover just sends x1 prime to x lambda prime. So what about soundness of our protocol? So again, it is sufficient to extract these two lambda integers, xil, xim, which are witnesses to yil and yim, and all have small digits base q. So we're gonna take our malicious prover, we're gonna rewind it some constant number c times, and obtain a new system of linear equations that looks like this. So each of these xi primes, these capital xi primes, has lambda different, has lambda entries, and each of these entries has small digits. Now fix this big block matrix to be A. We want this matrix to have an integer left inverse specifically with small entries. Once this happens, we are done. So this gives our key lemma. So fix their distribution D to be exactly as what the extractor does. Mainly it samples some constant number of lambda by two lambda binary matrices. It stacks them on top of each other and outputs this A. So C is a constant here. So if we sample A in this manner, then except with two to the minus lambda probability, A has an integer left inverse and the entries of A are bounded by two to the poly lambda. This two to the poly lambda is okay by us because it is independent of the value Q in the protocol. And furthermore, as necessary for the extraction, A inverse can be computed in poly lambda time. So I'm not gonna get into the proof in this talk, but the proof uses ideas from the theory of integer lattices, and we foresee it being a very useful tool in crypto based on integers, such as our work here. So just to recap, we give a proof of knowledge of exponent with small digits base Q. Uh, we highlighted a buggy protocol, and we describe our fix, from, which uses ideas from the theory of integer lattices and the subset product thingy. And as a result, we obtain a protocol which is statistically sound. And I want to emphasize that this proof of knowledge protocol captures the main te technical ideas of our polynomial commitment scheme and can be modified to the full version of our streamable polynomial commitment scheme with some tweaks. Furthermore, if we want logarithmic communication, we can just recurse log n times on this lambda to lambda lambda protocol. And then finally, I want to mention there's a gap in the completeness and soundness. Um, if we want to extract out B bounded digits in the extraction, then we need an honest prover to start with some B prime bounded, bounded digits, which is much smaller than B. Okay, so with the proven knowledge of exponent small digits complete, we're gonna move on to our next awesome thing, the proof of exponentiation for arbitrary groups. So the POE problem specifies a group G to elements X and Y in the group and an integer T. All this information is public and we want an interactive protocol or non-interactive protocol uh, that produces a proof pi, which attests that y to the two to the t equals x, or uh, sorry, excuse me, x to the two to the t equals y. Of course, there's a naive, so, so POE is actually a very important uh, component of VDFs and succinct polynomial commitments. And of course, the naive solution has the verifier just compute this x to the two to the t. This works for any group, this requires no communication, but the V 
but the verifier runs in time t. So can we spit the verifier? So there are a couple of works with sublinear verification. So PoE is sublinear verification. So Petrazar gives a statistically sound protocol in RSA groups. So this is only statistically sound in RSA groups where the verifier runs in logarithmic time. Wazolowski gives a computation sound protocol assuming class groups with the adapt something called the adaptive root assumption and the verifier time is constant. Then Bonet et al. observed that Petrazar's protocol um, is also computationally secure assuming other group assumptions, class mainly class groups with low order assumption. Okay, so our main question here is, can we get a statistically sound uh, POE over class groups or arbitrary groups for that matter? And in fact, yes. So in this work, we give a statistically sound POE that works over any group with, sub, with linear, uh, logarithmic verification. So what does this look like? So uh, just the main theorem, it is a public coin statistically sound POE over any group where the verifier time is logarithmic, the proof size and number of rounds is logarithmic, and the prover time is linear. So what do we do? We generalize Petrozark protocol to work over any group, and this can be made non-interactive via the fiat heuristic. So very briefly, we're gonna go over Petrozark's halving protocol. This is the core of Petrozark's um, POE, and then we're gonna give our modification. So the halving protocol splits computation of x to the 2 to the t in half via first computing this mu and having the prover send it, so x to the 2 to the t by 2. Now, if mu is computed correctly, as shown here, then y is in fact equal to mu to the 2 to the t by 2, so the power is split in half. Then a random linear combination is sampled by the verifier, which is then computed via, then x prime and y prime are computed via this random linear combination. And indeed, if mu is if mu is computed correctly and the x prime and y prime are computed correctly, then y prime is in fact x prime to the two to the t by two. So we go from an exponent size t to an exponent size t by two. So for the full protocol, you you recurse log t times, and the verifier checks the final claim itself. Okay. So what about our POE? So our POE is actually again using the ideas of divide and conquer via random subset products that we saw in the proof of knowledge of exponent. So we now again have a lambda statistical security parameter. We have lambda different POE instances, and we're going to do the same halving for each. But now our recombination is again via random subset product. So again, these AIs are randomly selected bits. Okay, so I'm not going to go into full details, but I hope you'll believe me when I say that this modification is complete, it is statistically sound, and it works over any group G. Okay. So that completes the section on the proof of exponentiation for arbitrary groups. And in fact, we come to the end of the talk. So I wanna end by first just flashing our main theorem and restating it again. So assuming hidden order groups, we obtain public coin zero knowledge arguments for languages accepted by a time t space s non-deterministic RAM, where the prover time is nearly optimal. The prover space has polylogarithmic overhead with respect to the RAM. The verifier time is polylogarithmic overhead. Um, the communication is polylogarithmic and the number of rounds is logarithmic. Furthermore, assuming hidden order groups, we obtain a transparent setup and we can make this non-interactive via fiat Shamir and obtain time and space efficient zero knowledge arguments, uh, succinct non-interactive zero knowledge arguments. And with that, thank you very much.